Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the uh, Hurry Institute for Computing at Boston University. My name is Eric Kolachik. I am director of the Hurry Institute, and that is unfortunately my cat. Apologies. <laughs> so our program for today is a brief welcome by myself, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Wen Li, uh, who is one of the junior faculty fellows here at the Hurry Institute, and she will introduce today's speaker, Jacob Bortnick. Uh, he'll speak for about a half hour or so, uh, and then we'd like to leave a good 10-15 uh, minutes of time for Q&A. So as a brief administrative or housekeeping point uh, throughout the talk, if you have a question that strikes you, we encourage you to please put them into the Q&A feature. Uh, we will be gathering those questions and then we'll be uh, using them uh, to facilitate the Q&A at the end. So just a brief word about who we are, uh, if you haven't heard of us. So the Hurry Institute for Computing here at Boston University is dedicated to initiating research convergence and accelerating integrated initiatives uh, at the nexus of computational and data sciences, particularly with an, uh, a view towards social impact. The Institute includes a number of centers and initiatives, uh, many of which you see here, ranging from those that focus on AI to those focusing on uh, uh, say risk and privacy and security and partnerships with various uh, external entities, including Red Hat and the city of Boston. So we have over 250 research uh, affiliates at the Institute doing an amazing spectrum of work. Uh, this is just a small illustration here showing you type of things we have people doing, ranging from cybersecurity to misinformation, artificial intelligence and cloud computing, contact tracing, conservation, and much, much more. But of course you came here to uh, hear about our speaker series. So our distinguished speaker series brings innovative speakers with bold ideas and computing enabled and data-driven areas of research to Boston University, or as uh, it is currently virtually to Boston University. Uh, the series hosts a handful of speakers clustered around a common theme. So the theme that we're working uh, these next couple of weeks on is machine learning for model rich problems. Uh, we have a variety of folks, many of who you've already heard. So you've heard uh, Cecilia Clementi speak in the context of chemistry, Miguel Besa speak in the context of material science, and you have today Jacob Bortnick who will be speaking in the context of atmospheric and oceanic sciences. So I'm going to turn this over to Wen Li. Wen is an assistant professor of astronomy here at Boston University. She received her PhD from UCLA and she's the recipient of a long list of awards I'm going to embarrass her with, uh, including the NSF Career Award, the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellow Award and the James P. McElwain Medal from the American Geophysical Union. Her research interests include the generation of various plasma waves and their effects on energetic particle dynamics in the magnetosphere, uh, both for Earth and Jupiter, as well as their relation to solar wind activity. And her group uses computational models to simulate energetic particle dynamics due to wave particle interactions. She's also interested in applying machine learning techniques to specify and predict the state of the space environment by taking full advantage of various sources of satellite data. So when I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Eric, for the very nice introduction. So it is our great honor to invite uh, Professor Jacob Bortnick to attend our distinguished speaker series to give a talk about machine learning to live near a temperamental star. So Jacob uh, is a professor of space physics in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences at UCLA, and he received his PhD from the Stanford University. So his work on the origin of the plasma wave called HIS was listed in top 100 stories of 2008 by the Discover magazine. And Jacob's group is very interested in a variety of topics that include lightning generated plasma waves that whistle, the belt of the ultra-red vistic electrons that encircle the earth, and making waves in the laboratory plasmas, and most recently in the application of machine learning techniques to squeeze knowledge out of data. Let's welcome Professor Jacob Bartnick. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. OK. Can everyone see that OK? Yep. OK, thank you very much. So um, firstly, uh, let me just say a great um, 
thank you to, um, to the Hariri Institute and the organizers of the seminar. It's my pleasure and honor to be speaking here today. And um, I'm going to be talking about how to learn to live with a temperamental star, or uh, more accurately, how to machine learn to live near a temperamental star. You know, I live near Hollywood, and so we have temperamental stars here all the time. So I thought I'd just lead in with that kind of title. And before I get going, I'd like to thank my long list of students, postdocs, and collaborators listed at the bottom there, uh, who have, you know, uh, contributed um, in significant ways towards everything you'll see here today. So I thought I'd start my presentation with this iconic image that you see on the right hand side here. This was taken on Valentine's Day, uh, that's February 14th, 1990, by the famous Voyager 1 satellite. And this was done just as it was leaving the outskirts of the solar system at 40 astronomical units, that's 40 times the distance between the sun and the earth. And this image has come to be known as a pale blue dot. In fact, this image was taken at the specific request of astronomer Carl Sagan. And he wrote a very famous book called The Pale Blue Dot on it in 1994. And uh, the pale blue dot that we're talking about is this spot right over here. This is Earth. And uh, Carl Sagan writes these iconic phrases. He says, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every tyrant, every ruler, every saint has lived their lives on a moat of dust suspended on a sunbeam. See, this is the sunbeam. And the moat of dust is us. This is the earth. Sometimes we speak about space travel. But in fact, we are all space travelers. We live on a spaceship. It's called Spaceship Earth. And we all travel through space together. And sometimes the space environment comes knocking at our door. It makes itself known to us in dramatic ways. So we live on our Spaceship Earth and we whiz around our nearest star at a dazzling speed, we're told, something like 30 kilometers per second. And of course, the sun gives us all the light and the heat and the energy that we need to sustain life on Earth. It moves around the ocean, it moves around the atmosphere, it moves around the space environment above it. And if you look at the sun, it kind of looks like a steady yellow orb that is fairly constant and unchanging. But if you change the wavelength with which you are looking from the visible light, something that we see with our eyes, something like four or 500, um, nanometers to something shorter, something in the X-ray range. So you're looking at much hotter temperatures on the sun. You see quite a different picture. So here is what you might see if you're looking at the sun in the X-rays. It's anything but steady and boring. In fact, the sun is kind of patchy. It's very active. And uh, sometimes it has these coronal uh, loops that develop above it. Sometimes uh, these coronal loops twist and emerge, and uh, you get these clouds of charged particles called coronal mass ejections that are emitted and uh, thrown off in all directions away from the sun. Occasionally, a coronal mass ejection is going to be emitted in the direction of the Earth. And so it impinges on the Earth's magnetic field. I'm going to play this one more time. The coronal mass ejection that is ejected from the sun impinges onto the Earth's magnetic field and is actually able to reconnect and strip off magnetic field lines away from the Earth's day side, uh, blow them back towards the night side where they reconnect once again. And the magnetic field lines are like elastic bands. They uh, snap back towards the Earth and they bring these charged particles which are then dumped into the North and South hemisphere and they create the Aurora Borealis and Aurora Australis. And this is what you see in this image right over here. So let's move forward. And um, I'm gonna play this video for you. Uh, there we go. I'm just gonna mute that sound. And uh, what you see here, I'm just gonna forward this a little bit uh, to maybe over here. What you see here in this video, this is a recording from the International Space Station. So of course the International Space Station is in an orbit called low Earth orbit, a few hundred kilometers above the Earth. It uh, orbits around the entire Earth in something like an hour and a half. 
And if you are aboard the International Space Station, what you often see are these beautiful green auroras, right? You're circling the Earth every hour and a half. You see this twice on your journey. And auroras are very common. It's a signature of the space environment and how it is interacting and impinging on the Earth. Auroras are very commonly seen uh, from the space station, pretty much at every orbit. Sometimes they uh, kind of explode and get bright and you see these beautiful shimmering curtains uh, or arcs. Auroras have been seen ever since man could uh, record, draw or write. Uh, Chinese writings go back at least 2000 BC that have been written about. Uh, the early Greeks have written about them. Uh, they're beautiful, they're majestic. It is the space environment that comes to earth. But uh, nowadays we have uh, another concern uh, when the space environment comes a knocking. And this is what we call space weather. The whole idea of space weather is how the space environment interacts with uh, humankind's technological systems. And what do I mean by that? Let's look at the picture on the right hand side. This is just a graphical illustration of space weather, how the space environment interacts with various technologies. So starting from the top, we can get these energetic charged particles that fly in from space and they bathe our spacecraft. They can degrade solar panels. They can charge up the outside, the skin of the spacecraft. They can burrow right into the spacecraft sometimes and deposit themselves on the electronic uh, microcontrollers. And so they can result in these spurious commands that tell the spacecraft to do all kinds of things. And spacecraft have indeed been damaged or lost when we have intense geomagnetic events going on. Um, the same charged particles are also a hazard to astronauts uh, when they do their spacewalks. They, are, uh, they can degrade um, GPS, right? Um, uh, global positioning on the Earth uh, due to the same effects. Closer to the Earth, um, very intense uh, mega amp ear currents can develop in this layer in the ionosphere, roughly at about 100 kilometers altitude, and induce intense currents into telecommunication cables, into electrical power grids and pipelines. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to stop and focus a little bit about this particular event. This is called atmospheric drag. And so for low Earth orbiting spacecraft, like we saw in the International Space Station, Atmospheric drag is a very critical uh, component of, and a very real danger. What happens is when you have these geomagnetic events, a lot of energy gets dumped and deposited into the upper atmosphere of the Earth. Of course, when that happens, we have heating and the upper atmosphere can actually expand. It can rise a little bit and it can present a much more dense environment for spacecraft that are orbiting at low Earth orbit and what can that do? It can mess up their orbits, right? It can slow them down. It can derail them a little bit. It can lower their altitudes. It can really mess around with the planning of these spacecraft. And that becomes a very important concern. Why is this an especially important concern right now? Well, I don't know if you guys realize this, but space science is in the midst of a revolution right now. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Currently, there are something like 2,700 operational satellites that are in orbit, uh, right? The total number that's ever been launched is something like four, 5,000 ever uh, in the history of mankind. Uh, the operational orbiting satellites right now number less than 3,000. But in the past decade, we've had a slow creep. The cost of getting into space has dropped by about an order of magnitude, by a factor of 10 and it continues to drop right now. That means that it's not only the large companies, the NASA's, the Boeing's, that are able to put up spacecraft at exorbitant costs. It's now much smaller companies. In fact, the low cost access to space has resulted in somewhat of a revolution where many, many companies are now putting up huge fleets of spacecraft. Here is just SpaceX, uh, just down the road here in Los Angeles. Uh, that are planning, they've already um, have concrete plans to put up 12,000 spacecraft with licenses for 30,000 more. That's just a single company. Compare that to 3,000 operational satellites. So we're looking at an order of magnitude increase, mostly at low Earth orbit. And, um, and if you look at the projections for several companies, you see this is a listing of companies that uh, 
have concrete plans to put up spacecraft. By 2029, that is within a decade, we have something like 57,000 spacecraft planned. That is a huge, huge number of spacecraft that are suddenly occupying an orbit of the Earth. Now, why is this important? And, and how does this relate back to this kind of heating of the upper atmosphere that I talked about in the previous slide? Uh, as a quick segue, uh, in the 1970s, the late 1970s, a NASA engineer by the name of Donald Kessler um, had this idea. And he said, if you put a lot of spacecraft in a particular orbit, let's say low Earth orbit, you increase your probability of collision tremendously. And so you have some kind of a probability of collision that two spacecraft or more will collide. Um, OK, you can quantify that probability. But what happens if you do have a collision? If two spacecraft collide, you have a fragmentation of the spacecraft. You have a cloud of shards that are several hundred pieces in extent. That introduces several hundred more pieces that spacecraft can collide with. And so the probability of collision for the next time, for the next spacecraft, increases tremendously. It takes a big step up in the probability of collision. When the next collision occurs, you have another cloud of shards, several hundred shards that are then deposited in low Earth orbit, again, increasing the probability of collision. And so you can see that we have this positive feedback effect that eventually could result in a catastrophic failure of the whole system. This is called the Kessler effect or the Kessler syndrome. It's been uh, the inspiration for several uh, books and movies, including Gravity in 2013 with Sandra Bullock, if you've seen that, and George Clooney was in that too. And uh, we know this, we understand this, we know that the space environment poses a risk, we're still going ahead and doing it. And so there's a real space weather concern that's starting to build in this kind of revolution that's happening in our utilization of the space environment. So that was my setup. And let's talk now a little bit about the data in space. And I'm going to change gears and start talking about um, the rationale for why we would use machine learning to try and figure out what's going on in space. So this is an iconic image. Uh, this was taken right after the launch of the very first spacecraft into space. This is Explorer 1. And here you see this iconic image that um, has often been associated with um, space exploration. Uh, William Kippering, head of JPL at the time, James Van Allen, the discoverer of the Van Allen radiation belts, and uh, Werner von Braun, uh, a former Nazi officer and uh, genius rocketeer that really uh, was brought over to the US, uh, enabled the space program, but caused all sorts of consternation, as you can imagine, in secure government facilities. So back in 1958, there was one spacecraft in space. Fast forward roughly 60 years, and now we have something like 3,000 spacecraft occupying space. These are the science satellites. This is what is called the Heliophysics System Observatory. Um, it is a NASA plus uh, European plus Japanese plus various other nations. All these spacecraft now occupy the near Earth space environment, uh, the environment between the sun and the Earth, various planets. They measure every part of our solar system in great detail and in great depth. And so this is where we are now. We have many, many spacecraft. They're returning tons and tons of data. Uh, if you want to make a case for machine learning, this is it. Uh, the amount of data that has been growing in the Earth and space sciences is growing exponentially. Here you see it, um, from the Space Physics Data Facility at NASA. This is another view of the same thing. And if you look pretty much at every data repository in Earth and space sciences, you see this kind of very quick rise. <clears throat> Uh, this is just an example of how much data is returned per project. And you can see that back in the 1990s, we were dealing with something like gigabytes, right? A, a total return of, of maybe hundreds of megabytes, maybe gigabytes uh, per mission. But now we're in the range of petabytes, uh, sometimes even exabytes. If you look at the square kilometer array that is in Australia and South Africa, the amounts of data that are being returned per project these days are massive, they're enormous. They're uh, reconfiguring the way we're even thinking about doing science. Um, a paper in, in uh, the journal Science a few years ago 
by Khan et al. has shown that the amount of data, uh, this was in genomics, but it, it's true across many science fields, outpaces Moore's law quite dramatically. Moore's law tells you that there's kind of a doubling every 18 months or so. So if you look at a six year period, uh, a Moore's law growth would give you something like a 16x factor of increase, roughly, right? There are four doublings. Uh, but the amount of data is growing by a factor of 10,000 or more. So the amount of data is growing much faster than Moore's law. We have more data available now and more data coming in the future than we ever have. But is our understanding keeping pace with all this data? If we get a thousand times more data, is our understanding a thousand times better? Is our insight a thousand times better? And if not, how do we get that understanding out of data? How do we extract the science from the data, from the numbers? So this is where things get a little bit complicated. How do you actually squeeze understanding out of all this amount of data? And how do you even handle data that goes straight into a warehouse and that you can't even move around because the data transfer pipelines are just too slow? So this is the case for machine learning. And what do I mean by machine learning? So this is a very quick primer right over here. Uh, this gentleman right here uh, is called Arthur Samuel. He is regarded as the father of machine learning. And so he really was the first to come up with this idea of what machine learning should be. And so let me tell you just uh, a few words about Arthur Samuel. So back in the 1950s, when um, computation was first becoming available, Arthur Samuel decided to write a checkers playing machine. But here's the catch. He wanted to write a program that would beat him. How do you write a program that is better than you? In the traditional method, oopsies, in the traditional manner of programming, when you write code, you have to specify what the computer needs to do at each and every step of the way, right? At, uh, wherever it finds itself, the machine needs to have an instruction of what to do. But if you write a computer code like that, then you always know what the computer is gonna do because you tell it. So I think Samuel came up with this idea of how about you write a piece of code, you write a program that plays against itself many times, but you don't specifically tell it what it needs to do at every point. You have it play against itself or against a human operator many times and you retain moves that are strong. You tell it what that means throw away the moves that are weak, and after thousands and thousands of trials and iterations, your computer code knows how to play a strong game. It knows what moves it needs to make at every point because it kind of figured out the rules by itself. You didn't specifically tell it what rules to follow. The computer kind of ferreted out the, the rules uh, and, the, and the instructions of what to do. And so this idea really brought about a revolution. And in 1959, Arthur Samuel wrote this uh, seminal paper about studies in machine learning. And he defined machine learning in 1959 as the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. In other words, you write the code that plays checkers against itself many times and you tell it what strong moves are and what moves to retain, but then you let it go. And the program automatically creates rules from data of what to do at every point. So I hope that gives you a very quick, quick and dirty primer of what machine learning is and how it works. <clears throat> so now let's take this knowledge and this idea and let me tell you how to apply machine learning to space science or what is called heliophysics or the physics of the sun, the solar environment where we find ourselves uh, located. And so the idea is as follows. Uh, a few years ago, I had this um, idea. You see, when a satellite orbits around the earth, it is located at only a single location at a given time. And let's say you sample a piece of data. And so here's the satellite is orbiting round and round the earth. And let's say every minute, you take a sample of data, let's say you're measuring the density of your plasma, how many particles per cubic centimeter. And every minute you take a measurement and you repeat this measurement many, many times throughout the orbit of the satellite. And let's say a satellite would take anywhere from 
several hours to several days to make a complete orbit. And so the satellite can be up uh, you know, in its orbit for several years. And so what you end up with is at a given location at a certain XYZ point, at a given time, you have your piece of data. And this can span for many, many years. And so you have this long time series of your data at one point in space over a very long time. But that's not terribly useful to us. What we want is a single point in time and many points in space. You want somehow to transfer all that knowledge baked into the data over many years of time in a single location in space. And you want that somehow transferred. You want it mapped into a complete environment at a single point in time. And so this got me thinking. Um, how about we use machine learning to try and learn what the satellite should see at every point in time, at every location in space, and somehow the machine learning code, just like the checkers playing code, is going to encode the rules of how the system works uh, deep into its guts, right, into its tune parameters. And, and that's exactly what I did. And so here's the goal. Given a set of sparse measurements of any quantity, Q, right? So we, we measure very, very sparsely the whole system. Uh, at a location R and a time T, we want to reconstruct this quantity Q over all locations, but at only one time point. We want to complete map, a 2D or a 3D environment. And you want your machine learning to somehow understand how the system functions so it will be able to reconstruct the system for you based on some kind of input parameters. Uh, just a few extra um, qualifiers here. What is Q? Q can be any quantity that you measure on a spacecraft. That's why the system is quite universal. It doesn't care what it is that you're measuring. It's going to encode the rules for that specific quantity. We're talking about neural networks. And the reason is a neural network is what is called a universal approximator. In theory, the bigger you make your neural network, the more it's going to be able to accurately represent any kind of mapping right, any kind of input to output mapping. And so that's a unique property that neural networks have. And we're using specifically deep learning because it gives you complex representations of your system. Our idea is to train a neural network in such a way that your machine learning model becomes very generalized. It should be able to tell you about situations that it has not seen or encountered before as accurately as possible. It should be able to encode the dynamics of the system uh, into its own into its own guts, right? Into its, its own internal system. And so that was the idea that we started with. And so this was the result. This is a paper that I wrote in 2016. And what you see here is a representation of a geomagnetic storm. And so this is a, a series of magnetometers. And when this value dips to let's say minus 100, Nano Tesla, it tells you that the space environment becomes active. What I did was I took data from uh, three spacecraft called the Themis mission. And uh, this was taken at a five minute cadence for each one of these satellites. I trained a neural network based on this time history here, the five hour look back window. And uh, lo and behold, the neural network slowly started converging and understanding what this data looked like and what the dynamics of it were. Here in these bottom panels, I'm showing um, <clears throat> snapshots at every time point indicated by these red dashed lines. And you can see that plasma density behaves in a very specific and a structured and um, kind of uh, repeatable way. So my machine learning algorithm has now learned that there's a dense inner part to the plasma density a, a tenuous outer part, and it's kind of more dense on the day side compared to the night side. This little white semicircle is the day, this black semicircle is the night. And now what I'm showing you is my machine learning algorithm trained on all the data from the spacecraft. And now what I'm asking it is I'm probing it at every point in space for a specific point in time. It has now figured out how to encode the dynamics of the system uh, internally. And I can probe and I can ask it, Tell me what the density is at every point in space. Tell me what the spacecraft should be seeing based on these conditions at every point in space. And so now we walk through and my machine learning algorithm is able to reconstruct this entire system. So as my geomagnetic storm progresses, 
the plasma sphere, this dense inner part, is eroded. It becomes smaller and it becomes kind of evacuated out of the day side. It becomes very small and symmetric and round. And in fact, uh, this is what we call the plasmospheric drainage plume out of the day side. And here, as we get to the recovery phase of the storm, we start to even develop what they call this little co-rotating plume. These dynamics are fairly well understood. This is why we started with plasma density. But my machine learning algorithm has been told nothing about the system. Everything that it has learned has come directly from the data. All the physics, all the um, effects, the dynamics are in the data itself. And it's, it is up to my machine learning algorithm to figure out how the system works. And you can see that it has done so successfully in the system. Uh, my uh, postdoc at the time, Xiangming Chu, has taken this methodology and uh, taken it further. And so now you can see a very similar looking storm shown in the red here. And this is an animation of the same kind of data that I've shown you previously. And you can see how the system now evolves in real time. Here comes the storm and you'll see an erosion on the day side. And as the system recovers, you can see that a plume is formed and it will start co-rotating with the system exactly as we expect from the physics. Uh, many of these events are out of sample. In other words, my machine learning has not seen this particular event. It has just reconstructed what you should see for this event based on other events. And uh, here is just a, a time series plot. And what you can see is in black, you see the observation of the plasma density in uh, per centimeter cubed from the three probes. This is Themis A, D, and E in black. And on top of it, overlaid in red, is what my model thinks that Themis should be seeing. And as you can see, the overlay is nearly perfect. Uh, my machine learning algorithm has learned just about perfectly what each satellite located in different places throughout the storm should be seeing. And in fact, that gives us confidence that at every other location in the plasma sphere or in the magnetosphere, the representation of density is in fact correct. And, and that is how we train our algorithms to be very, very generalizable. Now I've shown you a view of the plasma density looking from the top, from on top of the North Pole. Uh, you can do exactly the same approach, but include the third dimension, latitude. And so you can come up with a three dimensional model. Here's exactly the same storm. Now we take data from a couple of other satellites that are located off the equatorial plane. And you can see in this noon midnight meridional cut, you see what the plasma sphere is doing uh, in its uh, in a three-dimensional representation. And this is written up by uh, another paper by Shang Ning. So this comes from data from about four different satellites. The satellites were non-overlapping in time, non-overlapping in space. And yet when you stitch together their data, it is um, completely coherent amongst itself and it behaves completely um, uniformly, right? Completely predictably. So, why is this significant? Why is this important? Uh, and what do you do with this model? So here's a key point that I want to uh, express in my talk. When we do these models, oftentimes uh, in industry and in many applications, when you create a machine learning model of your environment, of your dynamic changing environment, that is the answer. That's the solution. And that is your goal. In science, we're, um, we're a little bit more fussy than that. We've recreated our two-dimensional or three-dimensional plasma environment. That's actually not our goal. That is a step towards our goal. It's our tool. That is something that we use to infer behavior, to understand, to create insight. It's actually technically, it's, it's a way of representing that very same satellite data, but simply in a different way. Right? It's, our, it's the same data, but presented to us in a way that we can understand it better. We can visualize processes better. Machine learning models, in our case, are not the answer. They're a tool to the answer. The answer is understanding, and that can only happen in our brains, right? The machine learning here is used as a tool to represent our data to help us to understand what's going on in our system. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Here's uh, a storm uh, that we found. Uh, and I'm sorry, I forget exactly the, the date of the storm, but uh, here again is this uh, DST or SIMH index. This 
uh, as a function of Alshal or radial distance and a function of time is the plasma density. And uh, this is now the three dimensional model that I showed you the animation of in the previous slide. So something interesting was happening when we were looking at this data as it played back uh, at, at this model. We noticed that at these very low Alshals, at these close radial distances, we had enhancements of density, uh, which no one knew about and no one expected, including us. I actually thought this was some kind of a mistake that the model was making. We did expect that as your storm progressed, the outer parts of this dense plasma region, the plasma sphere would erode. We understand that, we have good models for that. We did not expect this behavior enhancements at low L shells. And so we went back and we looked carefully at this data. And in fact, we realized that if you normalize the data here, according to what it was previously, there are these distinct enhancements that are aligned perfectly with geomagnetic substorm events. Substorms are what lead to the aurora that you saw in the very earliest slides, right? This is the, the space uh, environment's manifestation of what, a, um, of what an aurora is. <clears throat> we went and looked back at the original data, and in fact, we found these enhancements in our original training data. We then went to other spacecraft at other times, and we looked specifically on the night side at these low shell regions associated with substorm injections, and lo and behold, we discovered these low shell enhancements of density that no one really was expecting, and um, no one even now really understands what they're caused from, although we've had a, a number of ideas. We can take a slice in the Maria, meridional plane and we can see that in, at the time of these enhancements, these actually come out of the upper atmosphere, right? These are outflows from the Earth's uh, dense upper atmosphere or charged atmosphere called the ionosphere. And so in this way, we've used our machine learning tool for the purpose of discovery. Okay, we have used our machine learning model to show us things that we could not have seen in any other way. This is very, very difficult to see just based on time series data alone. We had to really see it in this way to understand that we're looking at something new. So I wanna change gears now for a little bit and I wanna talk about the future, what's next? I, I think, I imagine that many people looking at such a talk are wondering, this is cool. And um, I think the space environment is interesting. How would I apply this kind of thing in my own work? And so I wanna offer you a couple of ideas of what we're thinking about and um, of what you might be thinking about uh, in terms of machine learning. So I showed you in the previous slide of what we do with machine learning in terms of reconstructing entire environments. And there we just have uh, a model with lots of free parameters, we tune it, and we have a representation of our environment, which we can then play with and look at in probe. But what are other ways that we can learn or discern science from data itself? Well, a pretty new area uh, in machine learning and physics interface is looking for fundamental physics. And here I am uh, quoting one of my favorite papers by Sam Rudy et al, 2017. And the idea there is that you take three-dimensional data. Uh, this is uh, basically a, a fluid flowing in three dimensions and you can sample it. So in other words, you, you put a, some kind of a probe. So this is all simulation, right, in this paper. Uh, and there are a couple of equations that they're simulating like Navier-Stokes is what I'm showing here or what you know, he's showing here. Um, Berger's, Schrodinger's equation and so on work in exactly the same way. You, you sample your data and you figure out uh, what is the time dependence at various points of your quantity, for example, velocity, right? What is the temporal variation? And then you take spatial derivatives uh, around those same points and you fit, you then machine learn um, a relationship between temporal and spatial variations. These are called partial differential equations. And the crazy thing is, just based on this data alone, even sparsely sampled, as you see in the bottom panel over here, you can actually identify the fundamental dynamics, right? So here, your Navier-Stokes equation is being identified within a percent or two. These correct uh, derivative, spatial derivative terms are being pulled out. And your algorithm is telling you this data 
was driven by this differential equation. Think about how powerful that is. You can send probes to different regions, to different environments that you couldn't access, maybe to places where it's very difficult to get um, huge volumes of data back. But potentially in the future, probes could uh, do the science for you. They can say, this environment seems to have been modeled by this kind of underlying differential equation. In our own field, uh, much of my work involves these high energy structures here around the Earth called the radiation belts. They occur in two belts, an inner belt and an outer belt. And in particular, this outer belt is very dynamic. It's highly varying. Uh, it consists of mega electron volt energies. And um, we've been studying this for many years, most recently by the Van Allen probes, a uh, mission that went from 2012 to 2019. It traversed um, from uh, very close distances to very far distances. And we measure these distances in Earth radii, what we call L shells. And so an L shell of six, for example, corresponds to a radial distance of about six Earth radii away from the Earth. Okay, And we, we typically draw these um, on a plane that consists of the radial distance, L shell, and time is here on the x-axis, and color represents either the flux of particles or the phase phase density, how many particles there are per cubic centimeter per unit per cubic uh, velocity volume. And you get something like this. This is the, um, the outer radiation belt represented now uh, on a color scale. It's typically written, uh, it's typically described by the Fokker-Planck equation. We won't get into too much of the details here, but this is the Fokker-Planck equation. It has uh, the time variation of f, your phase space density, and it depends on a couple of spatial derivatives, uh, the f by the l and, uh, and the second derivative of l as well. So here's the second derivative of f with respect to l, and here's the first derivative of f with respect to l. And, uh, and where we're heading with this is what we want is we're looking for ways for machine learning to tell us what is the fundamental description? What is the fundamental dynamical law that you're following uh, that describes your variations? Now here, I'm just showing a simulation of this data. But where we're going with this is um, we're gonna mess up this data. We're going to subsample it. We're gonna put a fake satellite through this data as though it was being sampled by satellites. We're gonna noise it up in a realistic way and uh, and we're gonna deploy the kind of partial derivative equation, the PDE solver that you saw in the previous slide to a very realistic environment. And so here you see these terms represent the first and second derivative with respect to L. This is our simulation. Now we mess it up, we noise it. The way we should measure it on a satellite is what we give to our PDE discovery algorithm. And this is what we get out of it. Pretty much the dynamical variation is picked up correctly. And so where we're heading is we want to discover how to discover. We want to discover how to discover natural laws in realistic systems. This has been very, very difficult until now. Uh, but we believe that uh, we're now at the point where our technology, our algorithms are good enough that we can cope with uh, noise and imperfect data. And we can start ferreting out fundamental physical laws from system. See, the way we do it right now, is we, uh, we do these kind of forward simulations and we kind of guess what, we sh what should be going on to try and match the data that we measure. We do many forward passes and when we get an agreement, we say that we are right. Um, we believe that there's a better way. We say, we believe that the data itself can write down for us what the right equations are. So that's point number one of how we use machine learning. Uh, in Thank you. Um, uh, maybe a minute or two from the end. The second way that we use machine learning is what we call physics informed neural networks. And here, what I'm doing is uh, I'm showing you a magnetic field structure uh, based on two dipoles, one far and one close, representing the Earth and the Sun. In the previous slides, what I showed was a reconstruction just based on data. But when a human looks at data, um, you look at it through trained eyes, you know physical laws that go on in the back of your mind. And so now we can actually bake in physical laws into our machine learning algorithms to interpret this data. So here we say, don't include any physical understanding. You can see the reconstruction of this is messed up a little bit. But as you include physical laws more and more strongly into your reconstruction, 
you start to have a very realistic model. And this is, and this data was sampled very, very coarsely, very sparsely. And we're still able to reconstruct um, our environment uh, with high fidelity. My final slide on machine learning is there's a new range of algorithms that instead of solving partial differential equations in the traditional forward way, machine learning is now introducing ways of solving PDEs that are a thousand times faster. They require significantly fewer computational resources because they're able to map the progression based on the PDEs uh, in a much more accurate, robust, and very quick way. So uh, things that are only achievable on a supercomputer now in a few years could be achievable on your laptop or desktop computer. So very exciting developments and you can see how recent that is, just a few months away. So I'm just pointing to that. This is my summary slide. In summary, the data that we have in the space sciences is growing. We have an important problem. Space weather is becoming a huge concern. And we believe that machine learning has a key role to play here. Specifying environments, understanding basic physics, and even understanding how to understand, understanding how to ferret out uh, the fundamental equations and the laws that govern natural systems. And so um, I will leave you with a summary slide and uh, Thank you very much uh, um, uh, again to the organizers and I'll conclude my talk right there. Thanks so much for the wonderful talk, Jacob. And that's really fascinating. Uh, we do have uh, several questions from the audience and let me start from uh, the first one. So the, uh, this is one from one of the attendees and machine learning still rely on the knowledge of the physics for us to specify data sources that contribute to the knowledge of the entire state. How do you know otherwise whether the observations you have from the data sources enough? That's a really good question. Um, in every machine learning algorithm, um, there is bias. You introduce bias in various ways. Even just knowing what quantities to measure already tell you that you know something about the system, right? Um, and so, so, so that's point number one. You're absolutely right. And we introduce our physics knowledge and our bias of the system right from the outset in knowing what to measure. However, um, there are a very interesting and very fascinating range um, of, of algorithms. For example, um, there's an algorithm or there's um, a theorem called um, Tarkin's theorem. And Tarkin's theorem tells you that in a coupled system of equations, let's say you have four or five partial differential equations and you have several quantities. Um, if these equations are coupled together, it turns out by Tarkin's theorem that you only need to measure one quantity and the dynamics of all the other coupled quantities will be reflected, will be baked into the time history of that quantity. So it turns out that even though you're a little bit biased in what you measure, as long as you measure something that is dynamically varying and it embeds the dynamics of other quantities in your system, you can actually pull those dynamics out. You can identify how many unique dimensions there are in the system. And you can even have a guess at what the, uh, the differential equations are that govern that system based on just one quantity and its time history. Okay, that's a theorem. Uh, we'll see how it actually works in practice. Thank you, Jacob. And the second question is, uh, as we know, the large database of space observation comes from many different satellite missions, which lead to the different data characteristics. Mm -hmm. So how would the machine learning models deal with these differences to expand the data input? And in addition, can we expect to use machine learning to combine those data sources and generate a unified data product? That's an excellent question. Um, some instrumentation um, is poorly intercalibrated. In other words, when you measure a certain quantity with one spacecraft and one instrument, put in another spacecraft and another instrument to measure that same quantity, you might get biases, you might get systematic differences in your response functions. And all those, unfortunately, um, the machine learning doesn't know about. The machine learning only knows about the data that you give it. So it's up to the operator to be very, very careful and intercalibrate the data carefully. Now, uh, can machine learning be uh, used to somehow address this problem? It could be. I mean, you could train a machine learning model based on 
one satellite and one instrument, and then separately another instrument and another satellite, and see how they overlap for exactly the same conditions. And so you might give yourself some kind of an understanding of what the biases and the differences are between different spacecraft data. But in general, this is something that's not often realized. My students often struggle a lot with this, but 95% of your time spent in developing machine learning models is actually spent on tedious, unglamorous data cleaning, making sure that your data is good, consistent, uh, not biased, not noisy, and intercalibrated between different sources. And that's just the reality of machine learning models. Thank you, Jacob. The next qu question is actually quite relevant to that. So uh, for any model to apply, inevitably people will examine its robustness, uh, accuracy, and so on. So apart from the satellite validation, what else people can do with the machine learning model, especially the interpretability issue of the neural network? Yeah. Uh, interpretability is um, something that I would encourage everyone to, to think about, to look at. Um, so different applications call for different products for your machine learning, right? Uh, oftentimes in, in industry, when you're looking at internet traffic or you're looking for sales patterns, the machine learning can give you a model of what that looks like. And that is your answer. That's what you want. You just want to be able to, you know, if you're in an Amazon warehouse, to be able to stock the right product at the right time and have enough workers ready to deploy whatever it is. That is your answer. In science, when you create a model, as I've alluded to, you have a model, that's your starting point. Now what do you do with it? Um, and now you have to interpret it. Remember, interpretation, understanding always happens up here. Um, you have to interpret what the model means. So you can look at your recreated model. You can even use it for predictions. If you can somehow push it out into the future, that's very helpful. Satellite operators would love to know about uh, when, when they're hundred or several hundred million dollar spacecraft might be going into a dangerous region so they can shut down instruments, maybe put astronauts into a safety capsule or something. But, um, but how do you interpret? Uh, besides just looking at your model, how do you actually ferret out the physics? And this is where the art comes into the data science. You see there's data science and there's data art. And the art is what are the rules for understanding what your machine learning is giving you? I've provided a couple of ideas, uh, PDE discovery, baking in physical laws. There are other ideas that will tell you, even in a black box model, how your inputs interact to give you a certain output. So you can see, oh, there's certain parameters in the solar wind, like the velocity or the orientation of the magnetic field that will interact together and produce an enhancement. And there are automatic ways to do this, but there's no replacement for understanding. Um, even with PDE discovery, if you have a fluid and you, uh, your machine learning tells you your Navier-Stokes law within a, a percent, does that help you to understand it? Just understanding Navier-Stokes, do you now understand all of fluid dynamics? Maybe a little bit, but, but not quite, right? Um, so the understanding is always kind of like the art part of uh, data, data science and data art. Thanks so much, Jacob. Uh, due to the time, I will pick one last question uh, from the audience to ask. So that is, what happens when you have a mixed scale physics, like a particle dynamics versus uh, PD described physics? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, what happens is um, your machine learning is going to work at the scale that you, that you give it, essentially. Um, you know, if you're, if you're um, collecting data that resolves, let's say, scales of 1,000 kilometers, then you can expect that your machine learning is going to return uh, data, you know, of that kind of scale. Um, there are ways to increase the resolution. In principle, all the physics is baked into all the data. The way the machine learning works is it's going to uh, ferret out repeatable patterns in the data. And so even if your uh, pattern is very subtle, very small scale, very temporal, as long as it's repeatable, as long as you have a sufficient quantity of data that that signal starts to poke out from above the noise, in principle, your machine learning will be able to recognize that. But in general, let me say that you need to pay attention to the scales, temporal and spatial scales of the data that's fed into your machine learning models. And you can expect the machine learning models 
to return back a model for you that operates at roughly those kind of scale sizes. <laughs> thank you so much, Jacob. That's really terrific. And I also like to thank you uh, to the audience for attending and asking excellent questions. So if you enjoyed today's event, we encourage you to attend the next Distinguished Speaker Series talk given by Joshua Blumenstock, who is an Associate Professor of School of Information at the University of California, Berkeley, this upcoming Friday on April 30th. And uh, before we wrap up, I would like to welcome back Eric for closing remarks and thank the Harari Institute for helping support the organization of this event. Thank you. All right, thank you, Wen. And Jacob, thank you very much. Taking us all the way from the Aurora Borealis to the uh, deep depths of machine learning. And uh, I love the particular twist of uh, going backwards from machine learning to gain insight in the PDEs. I think that sort of uh, virtuous cycle is something that will be really particularly powerful. Uh, thank you, Wen, for uh, hosting today's speaker. Uh, Jacob is going to be back with us on May 3rd when we bring all four speakers from this, uh, this particular uh, series cluster together to uh, talk as a panel. Let me just say too, uh, Jacob, if you can let me uh, share screen here, sure. I'll, I'll put the coordinates up for those who would like to uh, access this video uh, again. Right, so you can find uh, the video on our YouTube channel, right? And uh, on behalf of the junior faculty fellows and series organizers, I wanna thank you for joining. Uh, we hope to see you at more of our series events. Uh, make sure to stay connected with us. Thank you, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob.